privilege and honor to introduce our next keynote speaker, uh, Paul Tillman, who is at the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. Uh, Paul joined DARPA in December of 2014 and is a program manager there with primary research interests in uh, intelligent and adaptive RF systems, which really means combining digital signal processing and machine learning. Uh, prior to DARPA, uh, Paul was a senior research engineer at Lockheed Martin's Advanced Technology Labs, where he won that company's highest honor, the NOVA Award. <clears throat> uh, Paul has a Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering from Rochester Institute of Technology and a Master's Degree in Double E from Drexel University. Please join me in welcoming Paul to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Ron, thank you for the intro. I didn't realize you were going to actually memorize my bio. Uh, that was very impressive. I thought maybe there were cliff notes, but it turns out there's not. Um, so if we just heard about 5G, I think my job at DARPA is to leap us some degree into the future. So let's consider this talk 6 or maybe 7G. Um, and, and what I want to talk about today is a program that we're running called the Spectrum Collaboration Challenge. SC2 for short. And SC2 is really a, an open competition where we're trying to bring together the worlds of artificial intelligence with the wireless spectrum. Very specifically, we're focused on the problem of spectrum coexistence, spectrum sharing. And what I want to start with is I want to make it clear that this is not a new problem. Spectrum coexistence, the problems of interference, harmful interference, have existed since the advent of wireless technology itself. Many of Marconi's early experiments had problems where we had ship and shore communications that interfered with each other, causing bad uh, performance of his radio link systems. Now, his solution to this problem, which he patented in 1900, um, really has shaped our spectrum landscape ever since. So Marconi's solution was, I, I got it. We're going to have a frequency tuning transceiver. We're going to create some orthogonality between our radio communication systems. And so now we can take different radio systems and put them on different frequencies. We can put different operators on different frequencies. Perfect. Seems to solve the problem. Well, if you apply this idea over and over and over again for a century plus, we get this. Right? Our wireless world today has been divvied up and cut into small chunks, handed out to different operators, different kinds of technologies. And for the bulk of the last century plus, this strategy has worked relatively well. But especially in the last 10, 15, 20 years, the demand and growth in wireless, and ubiquity of wireless technology, both commercially and in the military, um, has really put a... a has really struggled, made this system struggle, uh, in order to keep up with demand. What's more, for those of us in the military and those of us supporting the military, this is an even harder problem in the Department of Defense. So we have spectrum managers, men and women around the world, that day in and day out, hour by hour, have to manage the spectrum. So these folks have to take host nation requirements, what our allied uh, spectrum systems have to do, ITU requirements, host nation infrastructure. We've got to take all of that and serve as the sort of central point to take this disaggregated, dissimilar information on different systems, to pick up the phone and call spectrum managers in other countries, to call spectrum users and adjudicate spectrum conflicts. And eventually, they have to spit out a plan Something that says, here are the frequencies that will be used by which nations. And then as a plan below the plan, they have to say, these are the frequencies that are going to be used by different spectrum users, let's say, within the US Department of Defense. This process is very manual. It's centralized. doesn't scale. It's not flexible. And so as our demand for the spectrum has increased and will continue to increase, this approach really is being tried even more than the commercial um, allocation process. And so this is what we really want to set out to fix with the Spectrum Collaboration Challenge. And so we want to throw out the centuries-old playbook and take a fresh look at the problem. 
We want to reimagine how we can do spectrum access. And so rather than have our spectrum manager be the, the hub of a complex manual hub and spoke spectrum management architecture, we want to move them to be an infeed. They supply information into the process. And rather than divvy up the spectrum and say, here's what frequencies will be used by which radio users, with which bandwidth, with which waveform, instead, their job should really be to dictate what they want to have happen in the spectrum. We have to protect our host nation infrastructure. Maybe we have some voice over IP traffic. That traffic has particular latency and jitter requirements that have to be met. Maybe we have UAVs conducting surveillance and we need to make sure that that data, data is provided out to our troops. We really need to focus on what we need the networks to do and not how they do it. And so that's where we want to see the shift. There's no reason that a human shouldn't be able to take the requirements that they need for the spectrum, push them to the radios and say, here's what has to happen. You figure out how. And we really think that the way to do this is through what we would call collaborative autonomy. By having dissimilar radio systems work together to determine moment by moment what's the best spectrum usage strategy. How should we divvy this up? When can we reuse spectrum and improve our utility, improve our efficiency? And when can't we? Doing this, we think, takes three key innovations. The first is adaptive radio architectures. If you have a radio and you make it really smart, but it can't change the waveform, the bandwidth, can't change frequencies, can't do spatial beam forming, all of that intelligence is wasted. So we have to build this technology on the basis of highly adaptable radio systems that can be morphed to every circumstance that they find themselves in. Number two. We need a common language to communicate. How do I take dissimilar radio systems and allow them to share information about their experiences, about their current needs, about the interference that they're perceiving in the environment? Today, we lack any such language, and we need a key language, a common language, that allows us to do that. Number three, and perhaps most importantly, we need a decision-making engine. How do I take these disparate information sources and decide how the radio should change, how we should devise a new spectrum usage strategy? Most importantly, the kind of decision-making engine we need is collaborative. I don't need a selfish decision engine, right? I'm not just worried about one radio being able to move to a new frequency to improve its link performance. I need to be able to improve the performance of the entire ensemble of radios. So we think these are the three key capabilities that we need to create in order to have fully autonomous spectrum access. So at this point, all of you are currently typing questions into our question and answer box and saying, Paul, isn't this cognitive radio? Isn't this DSA? You can just backspace those right now. If I'll answer your questions on stage. Um, the answer is it depends. Both cognitive radio and DSA started with relatively grand visions, and then they had very specific implementations, very specific instantiations. Um, and so maybe it depends on who you ask, but let me try and answer the question based on where DSA and cognitive radio, uh, where the bulk of their research has been focused over the last 10 to 15 years. And that is this. Those two technologies are focused on a very specific question. Can we? recycle some spectrum that a primary user is not using. When they're not using the spectrum, can a secondary user come in and use it? It's great. There's nothing wrong with this problem. There's nothing wrong with the solutions to this problem. But it's a microcosm of the larger problem. If we really want large-scale spectrum autonomy, if we want to be able to nimbly configure and reconfigure the spectrum without years-long commercial processes in order to reallocate spectrum or hourly, daily processes in the military to reallocate spectrum, then the real challenge we need to address is how do we make dissimilar, heterogeneous radio technologies autonomously manage the spectrum 
but without requiring prior knowledge. You should not need to know the ins and outs of every other radio that you might have to share the spectrum with. On top of that, you can then ask a question and then can this heterogeneous set of peer spectrum users, can they also share with some primary user? But the real key question here is how do we get these heterogeneous technologies, these dissimilar technologies, to be able to in real time devise spectrum usage strategies? So, this is a really tough challenge. And the reason this is tough is because this is what we call a, a multi-agent problem. To help us sort of pull the thread and understand what a multi-agent problem is and make sure we're all speaking common language, let me start by telling you what a single agent problem is and I'll use the DSA example we just did as a backdrop. So in a single agent system, we have an actor and that actor is going to take actions on some environment and then based on the actions they take, the environment is gonna move from one state to some new state. And then I get a reward. If I successfully move the system in the direction that I wanted, if my job was to uh, minimize interference and I minimized interference, I get a reward, a positive reward. If I tried to minimize interference and I made more, I get a negative reward. And through this framework, we can look at the traditional DSA problem. Our states are simply the occupied frequencies in the spectrum and perhaps what frequency my radio is currently occupying. Our actions are simple, change frequency, nothing more than that. And our rewards are also straightforward. I want to improve the performance of my radio link. This is all very tractable. You can solve this as a reinforcement learning problem. It's sufficiently tractable that you could canonically write this down and sort of solve it on pen and paper. This is not the SC2 problem, and this is not a scalable solution that we can use as the basis of an autonomous spectrum ecosystem. This is the SC2 problem. We have multiple actors all acting on the same environment. What's more is that they're heterogeneous. They're different. They can occupy different states. They can take different actions. And maybe most challengingly, they have a different process of deciding what to do next. And so things get much worse in this construct. Our states are now the occupied frequencies, but it's also the Cartesian product, the uh, multiplication of all of the individual states that every single radio operating in this environment can be. That's a state space explosion. Our actions are now not just simple movement of frequencies, but our radios are much more sophisticated. So we can change frequency, we can change bandwidth. We can beamform on transmit and receive. We can adapt our MAC parameters. Perhaps we even do something very advanced like physically change the MAC itself. Maybe I change my spots, move from a, being a carrier sensing radio to a time division radio, or move from a time division radio to a frequency division radio. And now the reward is really challenging because the reward is now distributed across all the actors. The reward is now the sum of all the link performances, right? I want to improve every actor's outcome or try as best as possible to improve every actor's outcome. This framework, in addition to those challenges, is inherently non-stationary. If the red team takes some action, that will cause the blue team to take some action, which will cause the red team to take some action, and on and on at infinitum. And we don't have any prior models. The blue team doesn't know how the red team works. The red team doesn't know how the green team works, so forth and so on. So that's what makes this problem so challenging. That's what makes this a problem that's really ripe for AI to exploit. Since our focus is really on this large scale, heterogeneous sharing and coexistence in the spectrum, the program is charted out over three phases. We're in the middle of our second phase of the competition right now. And we're steadily marching towards our final phase where we'll have five radio networks all operating in the same environment, the same frequencies as each other, 100 total radios plus other incumbents and jammers. 
So I said at the onset, this is a competition. How do you make this a competition? And the answer to that question is almost always make it a game. And so we've really thought of this problem as a spectrum sharing game, as you will, as an obstacle course. Um, and the obstacle course, we sort of frame this way. We take five radio technologies from five different teams. We put them in the same arena, the same geographic area, and we give them access to the same frequencies. Beyond that, there's no rules. There's no approach to how sharing should happen. There's no requirements on what kind of technology is allowed. There's no division of the spectrum. These radios have to sort out on the fly how the spectrum will be used. Each radio team, as you see, has a job to do. They have voice over IP links or UAV or satellite imagery, or maybe they're just sending simple GPS coordinates. The biggest obstacle in our obstacle course is all the other radios. All the other technologies that think about using the spectrum in a different way than I do are obstacles that I have to avoid. Now, this is not the spectrum challenge, but the spectrum collaboration challenge. Where does collaboration come into play? Each radio network has a special node. We call it the gateway. The gateway has an air interface to talk to the rest of its team. But that air interface isn't going to work to talk to the other dissimilar radio technologies. Right? We have different physical layers, MAC layers, so forth and so on. And so the gateway node also has some out of band but common technology that it can use to talk to the gateways of other teams. So this could be a wireline connection, a SATCOM link, or maybe even an HF um, long-haul, low-bandwidth transmission. But it's a means by which the radio networks can share information about what they're currently doing and how successful they are at it. And by doing this, this provides a mechanism to adapt, not just locally, but at an ensemble level and at a means to drive towards our goal. Now, how do you win? How do you score? The more objectives that this ensemble can achieve and the faster they can achieve them, the better their score. So your objective is to get as many of the objectives, the, the required outcomes done as is possible and to get it done as quickly as possible. The ensembles that are able to do that and do that efficiently, effectively, consistently are the best scoring ensembles and those will be the ones that ultimately are the highest ranked. Now, how do we actually do all that? I just told you that we need to get 100 radios into a one and a half kilometer area and that we're gonna run lots of different matches and pair different teams together. Um, if I tried to do that outdoors, I have a challenge, right? It's, a, it's hard to very fairly create a repeatable testable environment. And so we built a massive RF test bed that we call Coliseum. And you can think of Coliseum as like two key components. The first key component is it's 128 two by two channel MIMO software defined radios. These software defined radios provide the common hardware platform that all of our competitors build their solutions on top of. The other half of Coliseum is a 256 by 256 RF channel emulator. And when we marry these two pieces together, what we're able to do is we're able to conjure up an experiment and take 100 radios and plop them in the middle of a field. And then the next experiment, 10 minutes later, we can have those same radios in an urban environment. So we're able to use our infrastructure to create an artificial environment that radios can see and operate in in real time. So for all intents and purposes, the radios see an environment very much like the real world, but we get that repeatability that we need to run a competition. The last two things I'm gonna to touch on here before I get off the stage, I wanna give a little bit of behind the scenes of where the competition's at and the kinds of technologies that are, are sort of being derived in the competition. I started by saying that the traditional world of DSA is not a uh, sort of sufficient basis to build an ecosystem on. 
Well, at our tournament event that we ran last year, our first preliminary event, we got some initial evidence that seems to indicate that that may be a true statement. So back in 2014, we ran a small scale version of this competition before we actually started the large competition that we're in now. And in 2014, we asked this question, can three radio links, not networks, links, can three radio links figure out how to share the spectrum? And the results you see here, the x-axis is frequency, the y-axis is time. The best performing ensemble of three was taking some DSA approach. They were sensing each other and avoiding each other in real time. That costs a lot of resources. It leaves a lot of white space. And we thought, if you try and grow this, that overhead of DSA is going to eat your lunch, as it were. It's not going to scale. And so the bottom here is showing our first tournament from last year. So now we're at three radio networks. Each radio network has five radio nodes, so the scale's gone up cons uh, considerably. And now, I apologize, but things are transposed. So the x-axis is time and the y-axis is frequency. But what's really interesting is that the best performing solution from that first tournament, the teams dynamically figured out a way to divide the spectrum somewhat equi equitably, given the technologies they had. And this was the highest scoring match of any match in the first competition. This gives us that little inkling of a hint that DSA and the idea of always sensing and avoiding and trying to stay out of each other's way will not perform as well as the ability to do something like dynamic planning or directly share information. Rather than have to guess whether one radio technology interfered with another, you can ask and they can tell you and you can do something different. So this has all been about spectrum coexistence. But if we pull that thread far enough into the future, spectrum coexistence moves from just how do dissimilar radio technologies occupy the same spectrum without some preordained plan, to can we have radio technologies that can maybe dynamically be interoperable, actually sharing information at the physical layer with one another? The animation you see here is our first little step along that path. So this is a, a move towards interoperability. What you're seeing on the left and right is a receiver and a transmitter, sorry, two transceivers, starting with no knowledge of how to modulate bits, right? Tr the transfer of bits into wireless symbols is an unknown process. And what they're doing is they're basically babbling back and forth to each other dynamically. So you see it starts and it's kind of fuzzy and it's not really clear where the symbols are and how they align to bits. And then slowly you start to see it separate and then it separates even further until eventually it's kind of this floating QAM 16-like constellation. That's about 200 milliseconds, and that's a neural network that's doing that dynamic adaptation. But they basically learned how to have a common language, a common modulation, starting from scratch, including doing things like synchronizing, with no a priori information other than some common preamble sequence that they should use. This is a really appealing uh, look into the future of what radio technology might hold. The fact that Perhaps we can use AI to help us adjudicate spectrum usage and we can do that in real time, but perhaps we can actually even lean a little further into the future and actually have radios learn how to interoperate with each other at the physical layer and have that be an emergent capability. So let me just close by regrounding us and where we are in the competition. So we're in the middle of our second phase. Each phase concludes with a tournament event where we run that obstacle course over and over and over and over again. Um, and we accumulate a score as we go throughout the obstacle course. Our second tournament event is coming up in this December. The top placing teams there are going to win $750,000 prizes and awards. Those prizes and awards are really just prep work 
We're getting them ready for the final competition. So we're partnered up with GSMA, and our finale event is going to be a live stage show at Mobile World Congress Americas in 2019. And what you're going to see on that stage is you're going to see teams proverbially duking it out in the spectrum for that top prize of $2 million. And we've got a number of good teams. We've got about 20 teams in the competition right now, about half academic and then the rest are broken down, small companies, individuals, startups, et cetera. So 2019, we're going to actually get a measurement, and we're going to get a live measurement of how close we've gotten to the idea of bringing AI to the spectrum and asking the question, can we take the humans out of the spectrum management problem, and can we instead turn the keys over to the machine? With that, I'll thank you guys, and I'll entertain questions. Well, thank you so much for the nice talk. Welcome so, back. Yeah. <laughs> the first question is that, how would you motivate the operators, uh, such as a Sprint, to go for it? Give me that again. How would you motivate the operators, such as a Sprint, to go for it? To go for it. Well, I think one of the challenges is that the spectrum is inevitably finite, right? We can't manufacture or make more of it, which means at some point our current process of taking one technology and saying, you're not using your spectrum, get out, go somewhere else, and we're going to sell or reapportion the spectrum, it, it has finite longevity. We can't do that forever. Uh, and I think most folks in the wireless have, community have realized that in addition to their exclusive spectrum, that some portion of their future operations will probably be conducted in a shared spectrum. So maybe not entirely, but at least part of their uh, uh, traffic may move through shared spectrum. To me, the technology we want to create in SC2 is trying to make sure that we can actually make some guarantees in shared spectrum about what you can do. Um, and without guarantees, it's really hard to build a business model around shared spectrum. So I think that's the connection between, let's say, the major carriers and where this AI-based spectrum technology fits in. Thanks. So how do you see the multi-agent optimization problem interacting with non-cooperative members of the spectrum? For example, malicious spectrum users hogging the spectrum. Um, so we should take non-cooperative users and break them into two classes. Um, those that maybe are grandfathered and have some right to the spectrum and those that are malicious actors, jammers, etc. Um, you're, in both cases, what you're going to end up doing is trying to build some kind of dynamic model of how those two actors work. You're going to treat the model differently, though. Your incumbent model, you're going to try and stay out of the incumbent's way, make sure that it can do what it needs to do in the spectrum. The jammer, you're actually going to try and do the opposite. You're going to try and stay out of its way. And so in, in both cases, you have to create some kind of dynamic way of representing the world as you perceive it and feed that into your decision-making process. Would project like uh, FirstNet solve the problem of serving these radios in times of emergencies? Mm. So there's an interesting overlap between what FirstNet would like to do and what Spectrum Challenge wants to do. I would actually look at the, the FirstNet principles uh, in the same way as we approach any other Spectrum sharing problem, right? It's an opportunity where you may have high priority Spectrum users that when they need to use the Spectrum, they need to use it. And when you don't, you have some secondary opportunity. But the other way that SC2 applies to first responders is that they have a problem that's very similar to the military's problem. On short notice, let's say there's a fire, a number of groups converge on an area, they've had no time to do spectrum pre-planning or pre-coordination. And so the ability to get your spectrum plan right before you can, let's say, fight a fire um, can be a challenge. The ability to have some technology sort of automatically take care of that for you in the background, I think, would be very appealing to the first responder community. Well, it seems like all the spectrum owners will somehow be tied up to this new system. Uh, would not this be slow down development of new technologies? Well, 
I'd think of it this way. Right now, let's say you had a fundamentally new idea that you thought really made a lot of sense in this spectrum. Let's say you wanted to build a business model out of it. Right now, unless you happen to be one of the few spectrum holders in the US, you don't actually have a playground to birth your technology on. Uh, and so um, I, I don't know that it would really slow down or retard progress of new technologies so much as actually provide an opportunity to accelerate new technologies. If we had a playground where we can bring new spectrum technologies to bear as long as they collaborate with the others operating in the same neighborhood, I think this actually creates and opens up new opportunities as opposed to sort of squashing them. Is the spectrum collaboration implementation going to be based on SDR software defined radio? Yeah, so each of our competing teams has access to a common radio hardware platform, right? We, we want their focus to be on developing AI and developing the phi, Mac, and network layers that you pair with the AI. We don't want people to try and win this uh, competition on the basis of better hardware, right? Better hardware just uh, accentuates all the good work that the competition's doing. And so uh, we provide a common platform. It's a commercially available Edis software-defined radio um, mated with a uh, common um, central processing unit as well as graphical processing unit. And the teams have all of that processing horsepower to put at their disposal, and whatever they can eke out of it, um, they're certainly welcome to use. How do you define a reward function in an online learning system where the performance might not be observed? So that, that's actually one of the reasons why collaboration is such an important element of what we're doing, because that, that's an excellent point. If I were to, let's say, take a traditional dynamic spectrum sensing and avoiding approach, I actually can't define a reward function that takes everyone's performance into account because I don't know it. But through collaboration, I can share that information. And so now if, let's say I hop to a frequency that suddenly caused interference for you, I would actually know that, see that my reward has gone down and I could adapt and, and uh, change to a different frequency or change my waveform. Have you looked at the field of economics and auctions to act an incentive mechanism to get even hostile actors to cooperate or a neutral Switzerland model? So this is a really interesting question, one that we get asked uh, you know, um, reasonably often. We actually, at DARPA, we don't control the collaboration um, language, the, the interaction language. We actually let our competitors completely define the language. We just happen to run a forum where we allow them to do that. And we asked uh, in this last phase, what are all the capabilities that you want to see in this interaction language? And one of them that we offered is, do you want some kind of economic model? Do you want to create a currency that can be traded and you know, DARPA will somehow incorporate that into the score? And the resounding answer across all of the teams was, no, we don't want it. So yes, we've considered it. We sort of turned the um, the decision as to whether or not the teams wanted an economic model and, and the decision was no they did not. Thanks. How close is the spectrum collaboration challenge activity to yielding uh, deployable solutions? Can this really solve the spectrum problem of 5G and, or 6G? So something that you have to keep in mind uh, with any of DARPA's grand challenges is that it's, it's often not about the exact technology that exists at the conclusion of the competition. Usually our challenges are meant to showcase that a new paradigm exists, there's a new way to do business. The technology almost always requires you know, another decade of research and innovation before it's really ready. Um, taken as an, as an example, um, autonomous vehicles. Our, our autonomous vehicle competition in the early 2000s is just now actually yielding consumer-driven capability. We're seeing autonomous vehicles on the street. So these technologies often take a decade or more to actually mature to the point of, of being useful. So will it fit into the 5G ecosystem? I don't know about that. Um, each of our generations of wireless tends to be about a decade, so um, probably too late to be in 5G, but, but maybe if and when there's a 6G, I think maybe the, that timing might work out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
for you. Oh, great. Do we need to? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yes, I was going to say. Great. Thank you.